So, before we start, let's pray together. Our gracious Father in heaven, because of your grace, we are here listening to your word, and we are learning many things, especially this time. We'll be learning about your second coming, and we know when you come again, all the born-again Christians will be taken up to heaven. So Lord, this time, help us to make sure of our salvation. Help us to make sure that we will be there with you in heaven eternally when Jesus comes again. So from the beginning to the end, I commit the rest of time unto your mighty hand. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Let's turn to Luke chapter 13, verse 23. Uh, Luke chapter 13, verse 23. Luke chapter 13, verse 23. If you have found it, let's read it together. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, here, um, someone is asking Jesus on a very important question about you know, how many will be saved. Is, are there many people who are saved or not? Uh, it's not about so-called Christian because I know there are many churchgoers. They come to church and they say they believe in God, but Actually, in their heart, they are not so sure about their salvation. So the question is, Lord, are there few who are saved? Are there many or few who are saved genuinely by the Holy Spirit? And let's see the answer in the next verse, verse 24. Uh, let's read it together. Strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Listen very carefully. Jesus made it clear that many people, they want to enter the heaven, but they cannot, right? Many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. So these many people, they are in trouble, right? They think they can go to heaven. They think they are saved. They think they are born again. But Jesus says, no, they are not able to enter the heaven, even though they believe they can. Right? This is the problem. Right? First of all, you know, I ask this question all the time whenever I meet so-called Christian. Are you born again? And some people say, what is being born again? I don't know. I never heard about it. And they are not born again, of course, right? Because when they do not know whether they are born again or not, how can we say they are born again? Right? Um, and some people say, oh, I'm not so sure. Uh, I don't know whether I'm born again or not. Okay, let me ask you. If I ask you this simple question, are you married? And if somebody says, I'm not so sure whether I'm married or not, then it's really strange, right? Because you know, it's a simple question, right? Uh, I asked one elder in India whether he is born again or not. Or actually, I asked this question to him. Are you 100% sure that you go to heaven if you die right now? Like that, right? If you die right now, because we can die anytime. Are you 100% sure that you go to heaven? And he said, I'm not so sure, Pastor, because uh, when I go to church all the time, when I read the Bible, when I pray all the time, I'm, I'm, I feel like I can go to heaven. but..." Sometimes I miss the Sunday service and I do not read the Bible. I don't pray, then I don't feel like I'm going to heaven, right? And I told him, you are not saved yet because you trust yourself, not Jesus. No, you have to make sure about your salvation. Especially what we will see to this session uh, is about the Jesus' second coming. Jesus said in the next verse like this, When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for, for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you, where you are from. The door will be shut. The door of the Noah's ark was shut by God. So even though people came after 
it started raining, they couldn't enter the ark because God shut the door, and that was the final. Actually, Noah waited more than 100 years. It took a long time for him to build the ark, and he was preaching to the people that they should be ready, and they have to enter the ark when before it's too late, but nobody came, basically. Nobody came. Only eight people, Noah's family, survived the flood. Just like that, Jesus said, only few, not many, and the door will be shut at some point. And that's when Jesus comes again, actually, right? And Jesus, this is what Jesus said um, regarding uh, until when, until when we have a chance to be born again. Luke chapter 21, verse 24. Let's read it together. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. You see here, this day are the Jews. The Jews, after Jesus was uh, died on the cross, the Jews will fall by the edge of the sword. You know the story, right? Uh, Roman general Titus came and killed 1.1 million people and be led away captive into all nations. They were scattered all over the world, just like Leviticus chapter 26, verse 33 says. And look at this. Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There are the times of the Gentiles. Times of the Gentiles. What does that mean? We are the Gentiles. We are the Gentiles. We don't get the chance to be saved uh, indefinitely. There is the end of this chance. The times of Gentiles will be finished, will be ending until, I mean, the Jer when Jerusalem, um, on, uh, as long as Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles, then there's a chance for Gentiles to be saved, but it will be finished. Because Jerusalem will be taken by the Jews again, and then it will be restored. So, the time is coming. Actually, Jerusalem is in the hands of the uh, Jews now. The Jewish people took it back during the, 19, uh, the Six Day War in 1967. And you might be wondering why then the Gentiles, the times of Gentiles are not done yet. Because the center, central part of the Jerusalem, the the place where the temple of God used to be is still occupied by Muslims. Uh, the um, Islam, that mosque is still there. So I will explain it later in more detail. So this time, uh, as I said before, let me uh, talk about the restoration of Israel first because Israel has been restored. Israel is the witness of God. Because God said, you are my witness. So that's why we have to take a look, close look at the history of Israel. First of all, what we uh, see in the history of Israel is this one. Israel is not like any other country. Israel, when they prosper, when they prosper and strong, they are very prosperous and very strong, like the time of David. But when they are falling, they falling down very hard and hit the bottom. So the nation Israel, sometimes they are doing very well and very bad, very, very, very bad. It's not like any other country. And it's because when they obey, God bless them. But when they disobey, God curse them. And that's why this is happening in their life, uh, in the history. And then uh, this is the lesson for us. So, last session, I told you, God made a covenant with Israel. When they obey, God will bless them. When they disobey, God will curse them. But eventually, eventually, God promised that he would restore Israel. God will forgive them. God will restore them. And that is the promise of God for Israel. Um, and this is time. Now is the time that Israel is being restored. By the way, Ezekiel, which was written 2,600 years ago, uh, Ezekiel is talking about the restoration of Israel. 
uh, in terms of the dry bones, dry bone. In Ezekiel chapter 37, God is asking the prophet Ezekiel, showing the dry bones, can these dry bones live? That was the question of God to uh, prophet Ezekiel. Let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. Um, it's really amazing to see this prophecy has been fulfilled in our time. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 37 from verse 1 to 3. Verse 1 to 3. Let's read it together. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and sent me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around and behold, there were ma very many in the open valley and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. So what Ezekiel saw is dry bones. Very dry means that they have been dead a long time. Right? And God is asking this question. Can these bones, dry bones live? Remember, Ezekiel was written 2,600 years ago. And Ezekiel was very wise. He didn't say, God, are you joking, God? How can these dry bones live? He didn't answer like that because he knew God can do anything he wants. So he said, Oh Lord God, you know. I don't know. You know, right? So let me continue to read from verse 4. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bone, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live then you shall know that i am the lord so i prophesied as i was commanded and as i was as i prophesied there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone suddenly the bone came together connected together right verse 8 indeed as i looked the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. The skin covered the bones. The skin, right? I like to see this thing, actually, right? The dry bones put together, and then the flesh covering the bones. But no, uh, it's not alive yet. They are not alive yet because uh, no breath, right? Verse 9, And he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds of breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. Verse 10, let's read it together. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Wow. The bones stood up, alive, and they became great army. So, if the scripture doesn't say anything more, then we don't know what this is about, right? What, what, what are these uh, bones becoming uh, living men and becoming army? We have no idea without explanation. That's why from verse 11, God is explaining what this is. Verse 11, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. They are the house of what? Israel. They say, we are dead. We are totally dead. We are cut off. And verse 12, verse 12, verse 13, let's read it together. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. This is what's happening right now. They were in the graves, totally dead, right? But God revived them. God restored them. They became strong army. And God says, I will bring you back to your land. 
They were scattered all over the world, 1,900 years. Wherever they went, the sword followed them and killed them. But now God says, I will take you back to the land, the land, holy land, the promised land. And you are a strong army, right? And that's what happened. In Isaiah, Isaiah also was written 2,700 years ago, and Isaiah prophesied that one day Israel become a nation again, strong nation. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 8, let's read it together. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Shall a nation be born at once? How can a nation be born suddenly? And that's what happened to Israel on May 14th, 19. 48. May 14th, 1948, Israel became independent and they became a nation. So this is the newspaper on that very day, uh, May 14th, 1948. What's the, what's the title? Headline? State of Israel is born. Isaiah says, shall a nation be born at once? Yes, of course, the newspaper says. In our time, you know, when you read the Bible and when you read the newspaper, they go together, actually. Okay? It's amazing to see that all these things are happening. And Jesus also talked about it, the restoration of Israel, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 30 to 33. Let's read it together. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. What does that mean? The fig tree represents Israel. There are three kinds of trees which represent Israel in the Bible. Fig tree and vine, right? And olive tree. Okay, so behold the fig tree, Jesus said, when the leaves coming out, leaves become tender, the branch comes out, then know that summer is near. Summer is the harvest time in, in Israel. So the harvest is near. By the way, this fig tree is very mysterious because a fig tree has no flower, but it has flower. Where? Inside. Inside of this uh, fruit, inside there's a fruit. Oh, no, no, flower. Okay. So this is a mysterious uh, tree because the flower is inside uh, of the fruit. And this fig tree representing Israel was very dry, actually. No leaves, no fruit for a long time. People said Israel is dead. No chance for them to be independent again. No way. Because during the Second World War, I told you, 6 million died out of 10 million. 60% was wiped out on the face of the earth. It looks like impossible to be independent again. But now, you know, the branches came out, the leaves are there. So now we know the summer is near. So the parable of the fig tree, fig tree means Israel. And branch and leaves means independence and strong nation. And summer is harvest time, Jesus' second coming. Why Jesus comes again? When Jesus came 2019 years ago for his first coming, he sowed the seed. And now he's coming for harvest. When he comes, he will take all the born again Christians to heaven because it's a harvest time. And when you see Israel, is restored, Jesus' second coming is very near. So Ezekiel chapter 36 is about the restoration of the land. I will show the land later, and Ezekiel chapter 37, which we just read, is about the restoration of the nation. So May 14, 1948, the leaders of the Israel gathered together in a small museum in Tel Aviv, and there uh, they declared the uh, independence. Right? The portrait up there is uh, Herzl, uh, the leader uh, of Israel, who was dreaming about the uh, independence of Israel. Uh, that's their hero. And actually, I visited, I had a chance to visit that museum. It's me. 
<laughs> long time ago. So it's a small museum, by the way. It's not so big, but they declared independent. And then the next day, very next day, the war began between Israel and Arab. Okay, I will talk about that war. By the way, after the birth of Israel on May 14, 1948, the people came back to Israel. All the people came back. So many came back, actually. Okay, so people coming from the north and south and east and west, all over the world, they are coming back to this promised land again. But one thing, very amazing thing is there. Isaiah, 2,700 years ago, already, already prophesied that uh, how they will gather, how they will come back. For example, from east and west, no problem, but from north and south, there was a problem. This is really interesting. Isaiah talked about it 2,700 years ago, but now we see them happening because this is a prophecy, right? So Isaiah chapter 43, verse 5 and 6, let's read it together. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendant from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Look at this. You should, you know, you should look at this carefully. God says, fear not. It's okay. You know? For I am with you. I will bring your descendant, your descendant from the east and gather you from the west. From the east, from the west, there were no problem at all. They just could come. But I will say to the north, what? Give them up. Give them up. Because somebody is holding them, right? And to the south, to not keep them back. So from north and south, there was a problem. So I will explain, okay? If you look at the map, again, look at this map again. Israel is here. East is Asia. India and China and Japan. They just came back. No problem. Nobody stopped them. West means North Africa and Europe. North Africa and Europe, they could come freely. No problem. But North means Russia. Uh, that time you, uh, the Soviet Union was there. They had a problem. I will explain. And South means here Ethiopia. Ethiopia. If you go down, Ethiopia is there. Why the Jews were living in Ethiopia? Because in the time of King Solomon, the queen of uh, Ethiopia came. Queen Sheba from Ethiopia came to see the King Solomon. And then when he, she went back to Ethiopia, she took many Jews as his uh, officers and servants. So from east and west, no problem. Problem, but to the north, God said, give them up. Because it was not easy for Jews in Russia, uh, Soviet Union at the time, uh, to come back. The problem is that at that time, the Soviet Union was a communist country. And the government said, the communists said, if you want to go back, you have to pay tax. Because in the communist country, they provide everything for you, right? Education, house, everything they provide they say, right? So uh, you have to pay back to the, the government before you go back. That's why they are protesting. Let my people go, free Soviet Jews, because uh, the Soviet Union was holding them. And finally, God says, give them up. How? One year, there was a great famine. Famine in the Soviet Union. Famine means no food. And that time, America, because there are six million Jews in America, America is uh, you know, under the power of Jewish people now. And then America was suggesting, the USA suggesting that, okay, we'll give you the food. You, you let them go back, right? So that's how the Jews in Russia uh, could come back. There were a lot of Jews there, actually, more than 3 million. So when I was visiting Israel, uh, one day we took a taxi, and the driver was from Russia, actually. Right? He said, many, many Russian Jews came back. So God says, give them up. And to the south, God says, 
Do not keep them back. It is Ethiopia in the south. What happened at the time in Ethiopia was there was a civil war, civil war in Ethiopia, and both parties was uh, taking the Jews as a hostage. So they didn't want, uh, want them to go back, but they wanted to take advantage of the Jews at the time. So one day, one day, Israel government sent many, many airplanes to take them back. And two times it happened, two times. The first one is called Operation Moses, and the second one is called Operation Solomon. Why Operation Moses? Because it's like Exodus, right? Exodus. The Jews in Ethiopia, they were uh, kept there back by the, these Ethiopian people, but they could come back uh, liberated. They were freed, right? By the way, if you just fly into another nation without permission, you are in big trouble, usually, because you are declaring a war, declaring war, war right? And that's what the Israeli government did. No permission, but they just sent the airplanes and take uh, 8,000 Jews in Operation Moses in 1985, and the second time in 1991, Operation Solomon, they took um, every Jew in Ethiopia, uh, the remaining ones, 14,325, twice. And no Jew left in Ethiopia anymore. To, to accommodate the maximum number in the airplane, they took off all these uh, chairs, so it's so crowded, and they were coming back, right? Isaiah chapter 60, verse 8 in the uh, above, let's read it together. Who are these that fly along like a clouds, like a doves, to their nest? Who are these that fly along? They will fly when they come back. That's what I just said. Isaiah said, your sons and your daughters will come back. Your sons and your daughters will come back. Right? And that's what happened. And when they were coming back, God also said, I will give you the abundance of the sea. Abundance of the sea. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 5. Uh, let's read it together. Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. Abundance of sea. What does that mean? Later they found out the Dead Sea in Israel. You know Dead Sea? Uh, it's um, no fish, no living life can survive there because it's too salty. Too much mineral is there. Right? It's a great tourist place these days because uh, you know, it's really fun to be there. You never sink and you float like that. Um, even if you don't know how to swim, it's okay. You never sink. Even if you try to sink, no way. I tried. <laughs> I went there. The funny thing is this. You see here people are lying. It's not fun. Actually, people stand there. Then water comes up here. Okay? I saw one family, some people, a group, standing, 10 of them, talking. And when you stand in this dead sea, it's, it's so much fun because when you move your foot like this, you can go forward anywhere, like, like this, right? But uh, you're standing. You never sink. And then you can go here and there, and then you can talk with friends. I saw one German uh, young man, when he came to this Dead Sea, he didn't know that it is uh, too much mineral is there. He just jumped. Right into the water, and then later he screamed, ah! Because uh, when this water goes into your eyes, it's, it really is uh, so painful, actually. Okay, so if you have a chance to go there later, don't do that. Okay, <laughs> so even uranium, uranium, they get uranium from the this uh, sea, Dead Sea. So uh, some people estimate that this Dead Sea alone is more valuable than the combined wealth of America, USA, UK, and France. Even if you combine the wealth of these three uh, big, big nations, you cannot buy this Dead Sea, right? And recently also, 
there's a good news for Israel. They found this uh, oil field in the Mediterranean Sea in Israel. The oil of Israel. Prophecy being fulfilled. They know. The abundance of sea was promised to them. They know. That's why they say prophecy being fulfilled. And now they are uh, producing this oil. So let, let me show you this uh, newspaper article. The headline is, Israel's coast may be gold mine of oil, says government expert. Gold mine, right? So now they are you know, getting this abundance of the sea, the, the prophecy fulfilled. And what about the power to get wealth? Israel is very special people. God is blessing them abundantly, especially in terms of the you know, this uh, financially, uh, material wealth was, is given to Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. Let's read it together. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives your, your power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. You know why God recorded this in the scripture? When Israel becomes rich, God didn't say this one. They would think they are smart enough to, to get this wealth, right? That's why God wanted to make sure, Israel, the reason why you become rich is because of me, God, right? Don't be proud, right? They are really good at, you know, making money, these, uh, the Jewish people, right? Lost child in Europe and Rockefeller in America, they are the one who is controlling these financial sectors in both continent. And have you heard about George Soros, this uh, Jewish investor? One time he was um, actually uh, he was investing in the English pound, and the government of England they knew that George Soros is playing with their currency pound, so they tried to protect their currency. But after one in one week. Uh, George Soros made one billion U.S. dollars, the profit, uh, manipulating the currency, the exchange rate of the uh, English pound. And I took this, I captured this from one of the document, documentary film. And these are companies are uh, either founded by the Jews or run by the Jews. You know, all these con uh, companies, you can see Microsoft, Starbucks, Intel. And if you, if you like movies, this is very interesting. Uh, this major, uh, these producers are all Jewish. Jewish. The Jewish uh, Harry Warner Brothers founded this one, Warner Brothers, and Paramount was founded by uh, Jewish Adolf Juka. Sorry, no English. And then this 20th Fox was uh, founded by William Fox, another Jew, and Universal also. Carl Remney, a Jew, uh, started this one. And MGM uh, was founded by Samuel Goldwyn and Louis Mayer. Again, they are Jews. And this DreamWorks, recently DreamWorks, were SKG, uh, Spielberg, right? And the other one, I don't know. Oh, let me see. Uh, David Gepen, uh, Jeffrey Kazenberg and David Gepen. Anyway, this SKG, three are all Jews, okay? So, you see, even this film industry, all Jewish. And I used to be in New York. I used to work in Manhattan. And people call New York Jew York. Because so many Jews and they are the one. Like uh, all the diamond and gold and um, many industries are the, controlled by the Jews, actually. Like uh, lawyers, medical doctors, all the Jews. Suppose you want to get a good immigration lawyer. You have to go to the Jewish lawyer, actually. Okay. God made promise to them. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 6. For the Lord your God will bless you just as he promised you. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You will lend money to them, but you shall not borrow. And uh, another thing, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 13. The underlying part. Let's read only the underlying part. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. Head means they will be the leaders, leaders of the world, world leaders, not the tail. Especially, they are so smart. So, uh, 
For example, the Nobel Prize winners. Okay, in terms of world population, they comprise only 0.25%. Maybe 18 million maximum now. Very small, much smaller than Korea, right? But 22% uh, Nobel Prize winners are the Jews and 47% world chess champions. Chess, you should be smart to play chess, right? They, they are the Jews. And 50% Oscars for best score and best songs, again, Jew. Uh, regarding these um, Nobel Prize, 41% in economic science are the Jews, right? 41%. Again, they are good at this money, right? And not only that, they are very strong now because Micah, Micah, uh, almost 2,500 years ago, Micah said, prophesied like this, Micah chapter 4, verse 7. Let's read it together. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation, so the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on, even forever. Why God calls Israel lame? Lame means crippled, like a cripple, like right? Why? They believe the Old Testament, but not New Testament. They believe God, but not Jesus Christ, so they are lame crippled, but God will make them a strong nation. They were scattered and they became outcasts, but now they are a very strong nation. So, Ezekiel chapter 36, I showed you dry bones becoming a uh, powerful army. And this is important. Why Israel, after independence, they never and ever lost any single war. Why? Because of this. Look at this. This is Israel. This is Arab countries and some others. Who is helping Israel? Who is helping? God is helping Israel. God is behind them. So no matter how many are there, the enemies, they cannot do anything. And you know, Israel is always winning. And in Joshua chapter 23, verse 10, this is the promise of God. Let's read it together. One man of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord your God is he who fights for you, as he promised you. Look at this. The Lord your God is he who fights for you. Who is fighting for Israel? God is fighting. And one man of you shall chase a thousand. One versus one thousand. And there's evidence. I checked this in, on the internet. Uh, whenever there's a war between Israel and Arab, later they exchange the war prisoners, right? So prisoner exchange. Following the 1956 Suez crisis, Israel exchanged 5,500 Egyptian prisoners for an Israeli pilot and three soldiers, four Israelis, right? Four Jews versus against 5,500 Egyptian prisoners. Right? That happens again and again in the history of Israel. Four versus 5,500. During the 1967 Six Day War, Israel took more than 4,000 Egyptians and 899 civilians, 553 Jordanian soldiers, and 366 civilian, 367 Syrian soldiers, and 205 civilian, while 15 Israeli soldiers. How many? 15. Only 15 Israeli soldiers and the bodies of two more fell into Arab captivity. Right? Only 15 compared to, to all this one. Recently, on October 18, 2011, captured IDF, Israeli Defense Force, IDF, tank gunner Gilad Shalit, captured by the Palestinian militant organization Hamas in 2006, was released in exchange for how many? 1,020 seven Palestinian prisoners. So one Israeli soldier uh, versus 1,027 Palestinian prisoners. That's what's happening, right? One will chase thousand. Especially the Six Day War in 1967 is a really great story. At the time, Israel was fighting against 14 Arab countries. Look at this. Israel is here, very small. And this time, because Arabs were defeated already a few times, 
So that time, his, they were thinking, okay, this time we'll do our best and we'll work together and we'll uh, defeat Israel. So 14 other countries were united to fight against Israel. Look at the size of the land. And then not only that, all the other countries, even though they were not involved in this war directly, they said, we'll support you. So basically, all these other countries were fighting against this one small nation, Israel. For example, here, at the time, like Lebanon, Syria. Okay, Israel is right here. Israel was fighting against Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Sudan, Egypt, Libya, Algeria, Morocco combined. And what happened? Israel won the battle in six days. Six days, right? Um, this is a miracle because it even takes more than, or more than six days to prepare for the war, actually, right? But the time, the war was over in six days. Not only that, that's when Israel took Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and then um, there were many miracles, miracles during this war. Uh, let me show you one video clip. Some miracles happened during this war time. There were angels uh, fighting for the Israeli soldiers, right? And then some Egyptian soldiers, they surrendered because they saw the angels. So let me show you. More importantly, why was this war filled with so many examples of unexplained events that worked in Israel's favor? Another great miracle happened in Sinai when uh, an Israeli soldier which, was, which lost his unit one soldier got area, lost. Suddenly saw a unit of Egyptians, military unit of thousands of Egyptians. And suddenly when they saw him, they lifted their hands up. They walked to him, ready that he would take them to captivity. He was surprised. He did not believe what he saw in his eyes, but he did it. He took them to captivity. They walked after him and he walked to the main unit that he lost. When he came to his unit, the unit was shocked. They rubbed their eyes, they didn't believe. One Israeli soldier is leading after him thousands of Egyptian soldiers with their hands up, ready to go to captivity. So they took them to captivity and immediately made the research with the Egyptian officers. What happened here? How you gave up? or one Israeli soldier, and they answered, he was not alone. Together with him were thousands of angels, each one of them with a gun in his hands, ready to shoot us. And they said, we are ready to fight against Israeli soldiers. We are not ready to fight against the angels of God. All these stories is not mystical stories for books. This is reality in the life of Israel. So one Israeli soldier captured thousands of Egyptian soldiers and that was because the Egyptian soldiers saw the angels. That's why they surrender and he says, it's not you know, a mystical story but it's a reality. That's what really happens in the life of Israelis these days, right? So they have become so strong and uh, they never lost any single war, just like uh, God promised. And even the land is now blessed. After the death of Jesus, no rain, and then the land became desolate. As Leviticus chapter 26, verse 33 says. Do you remember? Three kinds of curses. One, um, that they will be scattered all over the world. Two, the sword will follow them. Three, the land will be desolate. The land, actually, uh, the Israeli land became so desolate, like a desert, it used to be the land flowing with milk and honey, promised land. But God cursed the land with no rain, so it became like this. No trees, no animals. But now um, the land has been blessed since the independence, and um, the land itself has been restored. It used to be the desert, actually. Nothing was there, but they took the uh, water from the Galilee Lake, and that's how they changed land bit by bit, and now this land is very fertile. So I will show you uh, two pictures in a row to compare before and now. 
So before, you see this, this part, there's a main road, very few houses, but now so many are living, and then many buildings were built. And this is Tel Aviv, nothing there, actually. Tel Aviv, there was no house, no people uh, were living there, but now so many buildings are there. And this is Haifa in the north, a harbor. And you don't see many houses, but now, uh, you know, so many houses, right? And this is interesting. I took this from internet. Um, this is the border between Egypt and Israel. And Egypt, Egyptian side, still desert. Nothing is there, right? But you see on Israeli side, this green part, right? Another picture. So still desert, but here on Israeli side, there's a farms and there are trees. The land has been restored as God promised in Ezekiel chapter 36. So Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 10. Let's read it together. I will multiply man upon you, all the house of Israel, all of it, and the city shall be inhabited and the ruins rebuilt. I will multiply man. Many will come and live on you, the land of Israel. And Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 19 and 20. Remember, Ezekiel was written 2,600 years ago. At that time, they were not even scattered. They were not even scattered, but uh, Ezekiel is prophesying that they will be scattered and they will come back. So let's read it together. So I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed throughout the countries. I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. When they came to the nation, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet, they have gone out of his land. They were not scattered yet in the time of Ezekiel. So this is also prophecy. I scattered them among the nations. Why in the past tense? When it's so sure, God just says in the past tense. So I scattered them among the nations. But where, wherever they go, they profaned my holy name. The name of God has been profaned, has been defiled. Actually, this is why God is restoring them, they are, uh, God is taking them back, and I will sanctify my great name. Remember, Israel, still they don't believe in Jesus. They still do not obey God. Then why God restore them? Because God wants to sanctify God's great name. Many people say, oh, maybe God is dead. Look at his people. So that's why God is restoring them to glorify his name. Okay. This part, uh, underline part, let's read it together. I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. All countries. I will gather you out of all countries. And that's what happened um, after the independence of Israel. Then, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 36, let's read it together. Then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it and I will do it. God spoke 2,600 years ago and that he's doing now. Right? This was happening in Israel. So they are very strong. They are very prosperous and they are enjoying their lives. Of course, sometimes there's a tension between Palestinians and then Arabs, but still, Israel is uh, really prospering now. Uh, let me show you uh, one video clip, because last year was the uh, 70s, sorry, uh, 70s uh, anniversary of their independence, and this is celebrating their 70th anniversary of independence and the title is Do You See the Miracle? Because they also know that it's a miracle that they became independent and they are now strong and prosperous. It's a miracle. Let me show you.
This year we celebrate 70 years the reestablishment of our beloved country Israel. 70 years is monumental, for a man's days are 70 years on earth. For the first time in 2,000 years, a Jew could be born in the land of Israel, live a full life, die in the land of Israel, free, never knowing the exile. This year we celebrate 1948. 1,948 years ago, the Roman Empire destroyed our lives. They burned and demolished our temple and exiled the Jews from Jerusalem, all while gloating their vicious imperial conquest and victory. The Jews rebelled and fought valiantly for their freedom. The rebellion was crushed and the Jewish people found themselves homeless, helpless and lost for centuries upon centuries. The long and bitter Jewish exile reached the darkest time in human history. As we celebrate 70 years, we must remember where we were only 74 years ago. And I saw a great open space with dry bones. Can these bones live? Only you know. After the UN voted in favor of the partition plan on May 14, 1948, the fifth of ER, the British mandate was due to expire. The year was fraught with countless dangers, escalating Arab violence across the land of Israel, combined with threats of annihilation from every bordering country. American President Harry Truman, in a power play against Russia, began to pressure the United Nations to reject the partition plan and snuff out Israel's hope for independence. The generals of the Haganah and Palmach stood together opposing Ben-Gurion's plan to declare a state. On May 13th, the eve of the Declaration of Independence, General George Marshall, then Secretary of State of the United States, sent Ben-Gurion a brutal ultimatum, demanding the postponement of the Declaration of Independence. Marshall, together with the Secretary of Defense, James Forrestal, imposed a military embargo. They threatened that Ben-Gurion's Declaration of Independence would trigger a regional war, which would doom the Jewish people to a second Holocaust in less than 10 years and the United States would not provide any assistance to the Jews. Intel arrived that Britain had supplied arms to Egypt, Jordan, and Iraq, preparing them for the attack. The Palmach force of the Haganah numbered only 300. They had almost no equipment and no uniforms. Only half the men in each unit had guns. All of the freedom fighters of Israel, the Haganah, Etzel, and Lehi together, numbered only a few thousand. On the eve of the declaration, Israel's army was ill-equipped, unorganized, with no tanks, no real air force, and no battle plan, against five professional armies, trained and funded by the British. How could the Jews defend themselves? Standing alone against Israel's top military and political ranks, betrayed, isolated, and threatened by the international community, including the United States, with Arab armies invading from every front, it was now, or maybe never, Under extraordinary pressure, a self-proclaimed secular Zionist, David Ben-Gurion, was overcome, possessed with a Ruach Gvura, a courageous spirit of biblical proportions. And just like that, 2,000 years of exile came to an end. 1,948 years ago, Jerusalem was destroyed. We are celebrating the most legendary comeback story in human history. Can these bones live? Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. Thus says the Lord Hashem, I'm going to open your graves and lift you out of your graves, my people, and bring you to the land of Israel. From dry bones and ashes, total despair and desperation, Israel was resurrected from the dead and new life was breathed into the Jewish people. Seventy years ago, there were 600,000 Jews in Israel. 
Today, there are over 6.5 million from over 100 countries. In 70 years, Israel went from having one asphalt road to building Ben-Gurion International Airport, some of the best hospitals in the world, and built more roads and infrastructure per capita and faster than any other place on the planet. Israel has transformed a barren, desolate, non-productive land into one of the most powerful economies in the world. There are more Torah institutions and more Jewish learning in the land of Israel than any other time in Jewish history. From a group of underground and underarmed freedom fighters, the IDF has emerged as one of the most respected militaries in the world. The number 70 is represented in Hebrew by the letter Ayn, which also means I. For 1,948 years, the Jewish people have been praying, May our eyes see your return to Zion. We're not praying that one day we hope to see your return to Zion. Let our eyes see that it's already happening. So they know Ezekiel chapter 37 is about them, right? So they is keep talking about the dry bones. They know they are dry bones. And they know that Ezekiel chapter 37 has been fulfilled because they have become very strong. So look at this. Now, Israel has been recovered, restored, so the desolate land become fertile land, and they were scattered, but now they are a strong nation, and they suffered during the Holocaust, but now they are prospering. And that's why we call them God's witness. Israel is God's witness. Why? First, the history of Israel has been unfolded exactly as was prophesied in the Bible. So their history was written beforehand. And, and now it, they are happening, right? Secondly, the restoration of Israel is a much bigger miracle than raising of the dead. Jesus raised up uh, three dead people, but this is a bigger miracle, actually. The restoration of the whole nation. And that's what we see. There are many lessons we can learn from the history of Israel. We learned that why they killed Jesus, why they disobeyed, and what happened to them is all uh, uh, lessons for us. And also God kept his promise that uh, God re restored them according to his prophecy. So we know God keeps his promise. And this is most important, right? We know that Jesus' second coming is near because Israel has been restored. This restoration of Israel is one of the signs for Jesus' second coming. Jesus said he will come again, and before it happens, we see many signs, and this is one of the signs, the restoration of Israel. And that's why we know that the Jesus' second coming is very near. right? Uh, so we'll have a five-minute break, and I will talk about the Jesus' second coming and the signs of Jesus' second coming after five-minute break. Okay, so I told you that the uh, restoration of Israel is one of the signs of Jesus' second coming. But there are more signs, actually, um, which will happen before Jesus comes again. Can somebody close the door here? Yeah. Um, let's see this picture. This is uh, what happened in China. One time there was an earthquake in China, but a few days before the earthquake happened, this toad, the toad, these toads were moving um, as a group. You know, many many toads were moving to somewhere else before the earthquake happened. Actually, right? Why? Because they know something is coming. So they are like escaping, and then they are going somewhere. Just like that, we should be able to know that around what time Jesus will come, because there are many signs in the Bible. Actually, in Luke chapter 12, verse 56, Jesus called the Jews hypocrite, especially the leaders. Let me read Luke chapter 12, verse 56. Hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky and of the, of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Jesus said, you know, when you see the cloud from the west, you know it will be raining because 
west is the Mediterranean Sea. So the Israeli people said when they see the cloud from the west, it will rain on that day. Or when they see the, the, the wind is blowing from the south, because south is the desert, they say, oh, today it will be very hot. Just like that. They could discern the face of the sky, which means the daily weather. But how can you not discern this time? Why? Because it's all in the Bible, especially for us. Let me remind you that the second coming of Jesus Christ, one, every verse out of 25 verses in the New Testament mentions about the second coming of Jesus Christ, which means there are many places which the Bible talks about the second coming of Jesus Christ. So you should know, actually. If you do not know, you are also a hypocrite because God gave so many signs and made it clear that we have to know these signs. So, especially today, we'll study Matthew chapter 24 because Matthew chapter 24 is about the signs of Jesus' second coming. One day, Jesus will come. When he came for the first time, he was coming as a human being, as a baby, laid in a manger, in a very lowly condition. But when he comes again, it's totally different. Jesus comes again in glory as King of kings and then the Lord of lords. So this is the promise. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. Let's read it together. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with the power and great glory. When he comes again, he's coming on the clouds. He's not born as a human being again. He will come on the clouds with a, such a great power and with such a great glory. And that's what Jesus said. The question is when? When he will come again? So regarding that question when, uh, 2,000 years ago, the disciples of Jesus asked Jesus a very important question regarding the signs of his second coming. So Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, let's read it together. Now, as is said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They knew Jesus would come again. But they didn't know when. So they were asking, Jesus, what are the signs of your coming? And when Jesus comes again, it is connected to the end of age. So what is the sign of the end of age, end of the human history? And just imagine, you know, if Jesus was just a human being, not the son of God or not God-man, then he couldn't answer this question. But Jesus didn't even hesitate, and he started talking about all kinds of signs which will happen before he comes again. So that's what we'll see today, Matthew chapter 24, verse 4 and 5. Let's read it together. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. The first sign will be there will be many false prophets and false Christ who will say, I am the Christ. And that's really happening. In Korea, for example, um, the title says, There are 50 false Christ and 20 false gods in Korea. I think we have more than enough, right? Too many. Because, uh, you know, these are all the false Christ and false God. And some people, they, you know, say this saying, Second Coming Jesus, right? Uh, his name is Choi Woo Pyeong. Okay, so um, whenever we see this kind of person, we know right away he's not the true Christ because Jesus will come on the cloud and all the nations will see and mourn like that, right? So, not only in Korea, many places in the world there are false Christ like this, right? Uh, these are the people who claim they are the Christ. Uh, I think some look like, right? Um, 
I think the problem is, look at this. Not these false cries, but these people following them, they are more problematic, right? Because the Bible clearly says that when Jesus comes again, he will come in power and glory on the clouds. But they're not like that. You know, they're just, uh, just people, right? Um, in Puerto Rico, that this person claimed he's Jesus. And people, you know, greeting him and then welcoming him. Let me show you. And greets him with calls of daddy. Oh, Bali! He claimed he's praises. Jesus. He is 60-year-old Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda. There are many, actually. There are many. Um, they call him daddy, you know, and they follow him. We are living in very dangerous age now because there are so many false Christ and false teaching and false doctrine. Many of them are related to the second coming of Jesus because if we do not study the signs of Jesus' second coming, then we might be deceived too. But we know many things about Jesus' second coming because uh, uh, especially Matthew chapter 24, uh, Jesus is mentioning Many signs. So verse 6 and 7, let's read it together. And you will hear of words and rumors of words. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and the kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Look at this. Before Jesus, Jesus comes again, you will hear of words, and there will be rumors of words. Rumors of words. Words will be going on. And there will be famines. Famines. No food. Pestilences. Disease. Earthquakes. In various places, which means many places. Not just here and there. In many places, we'll see famines, pestilences, Earthquakes. Jesus made it clear when you see these signs coming, that means Jesus' second coming is near. So let's see one by one. For example, earthquake. Earthquake. Um, earthquake. We are having more and more earthquake these days. You can check it from this graph. So this is a USGS, the uh, US uh, agency about you know detecting the earthquake from 1900. To 2008, uh, the frequency of the earthquake, right, um, between magnitude six and eight. If earthquake is above magnitude six, the building will collapse. Actually, right. That's why it's important. And you see, from 1900, the number of the earthquakes is uh, rather, you know, stable. I mean, the same, but suddenly, from this. Um, now, at the end of the 20th century and the beginning of 21st century, it surges, right? Right? Yeah. So this is what we see. And have you heard about this ring of fire? Ring of fire. This is uh, where there are frequent earthquakes these days. There's no place to hide. That's the danger of earthquakes. You cannot hide because... Now, earthquake, the building can collapse, the road can split up. What can you do? So um, when I was in India, there was an earthquake in Nepal killing almost 9,000 people in 2015. Um, you know, the earthquake is really um, scary. And because uh, the buildings are not so uh, they are not so secure, many buildings collapsed and then Many people died in, in Nepal, okay? And in Haiti, uh, 2010, almost uh, 250,000 people died because of this earthquake. And let me sh tell you, why we have more and more earthquake? The answer is because this world is becoming more and more sinful. So. Isaiah chapter 24, verse 19 and 20. Let's read it together. The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. 
the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it and it will fall and not rise again. Its transgression, its sin shall be heavy. Even in Korea now, like, uh, uh, you know, this people say that uh, this homosexuality is not sin. Uh, the same-sex marriage should be allowed, and the adultery is not sin, right? It's happening in Korea. So it's changing so fast. People, you know, the concept of sins are changing, and many things which were sin before, is not, they are not sin anymore, right? And people say abortion, let's legalize abortion. Abortion is killing the baby. Right? But now the women say, why do you care in whatever I do with my own body? You know, this is my body. I have right to do whatever to my body. No, the baby is independent alive. You know, it's not part of their body. The blood type is different. right? Because the sin is heavy upon the earth, that's why God is sending this earthquake to wake us up. Wake up! Right? Jesus is coming soon. Wake up. This is a wake up call. And when the earthquake happens in the sea, it becomes a tsunami. You know tsunami? The very huge tide, wave, come and, uh, you know, kill so many people and destroy all the buildings, basically wipe out the whole region. And in Luke chapter 21, verse 25, Jesus talked about the tsunami. Because people will be afraid of these waves roaring. Uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 25. Let's read it together. And there will be signs in sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the signs is the sea and the waves roaring. Roaring is like a lion is roaring. <laughs> roaring. So just like that. The, the sea wave coming roaring like a lion and killing many. So last year, 2018, in Indonesia, there was a tsunami killing 2,256. Maybe you don't remember because they are happening so many times these days. You don't even care. So this is what happened in Indonesia. See, uh, usually the children die. right? And before that, 2010 in Indonesia, there was a tsunami, I think around the Christmas time, I remember. And at that time, 250,000 died in Indonesia. Again and again. And I will show you the picture of the Sumatra mountain, which shifted a little bit uh, in the time of tsunami. This is the usual, normal condition. But after the tsunami, it became like this. Do you see any houses? It's all gone, right? And that's why 250,000 died. This tsunami is so strong. When the tsunami comes, it can take the car back to the, back to the sea. The tsunami comes and takes everything back to the sea. It's, it's very strong, okay? And Jesus talked about the sea and the waves roaring. And what about the wars? War and terrors. In Luke chapter 21, verse 11, Jesus mentioned terrors, terror. Uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 11, let's read it together. And there will be great earthquakes and in various places plagues and famines, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. There will be terrors. Terror is also part of the world, right? So, Terrors are everywhere these days. No place is secure. And do you remember in 2001, 9-11, the September 11th, the twin building, buildings uh, were destroyed, killing 2,749 people. Mm, I was right there, actually. Okay? My office was very near, five-minute walk, so I was there. I saw the... The, uh, the office document was flying everywhere, and some people are really falling down, and police came and said, go back to your office, it's dangerous, and after I came back to my office, I heard the, the, the big bang sound, and then the twin building collapsed. And then the dust was everywhere, dust. I couldn't see. 
Uh, so we seal the windows and then internet down, mobile phone down. The radio is working. Radio is very useful that time. Um, and then the and then the pay phone, pay phone, mobile phone not working because everyone is trying to call, right? So these kind of terrors is a small war. And Jesus said, there'll be the rumors of wars and terrors. Have you heard about IS, Islamic State? And they are, they are causing terrors many places. And actually, I don't know whether you remember or not, last month in Sri Lanka, bomb blast, killing 250 people. Do you remember? There was a bomb, bombing in Sri Lanka on Easter in the church. So many people died in the church during the Easter service, Easter, right? Because it's happening so many times, now you don't even notice, right? It's uh, every day, here and there, we hear about these terrors. That's why. And remember, this is what Jesus said. You will hear about wars and rumors of wars and terrors. And what about famine? Okay, famine means... Uh, no food to eat. In Korea, I found that famine is not a problem. The opposite is a problem. People try not to eat, right? Uh, they want to lose weight. And that's why, because of that, we don't think about famine seriously because we have a plen plenty of food, actually, right? But remember, in many places now, people are dying of hunger. There's famine everywhere, especially in Africa, right? Especially the children die uh, because they are the one who cannot manage, right? So people say 15 million children die of hunger every year. I don't know what's the population of Suwon. A little bit more than 1 million. Suwon is a big city with more than 1 million, but 15 million, like a 15 Suwon cities are gone every year, which means 40,000 a day, 40,000 a day. Even today, 40,000 children died because they have no food, right? That's the fact. And this hunger belt is expanding because of the weather change. Many places becoming desert, desert, desert. The desolate land are expanding these days, right? The famine is really serious matter. Whatever Jesus said is happening now, and what about disease? Are we prepared? Let, I'm just reading. Are we prepared for the next emerging infections, infectious disease pandemic? Pandemic is something uh, uh, spread worldwide. Pandemic and killing so many. So these days we hear about many different kinds of disease. Uh, have you heard about Ebola virus? Ebola. People say Ebola is like a ghost. Ghost. They are spreading. There's an Ebola outbreak in one place. It goes on for some months, and then suddenly it disappears. And then it goes to another place. The outbreak is there. I heard this story. In some uh, country in Africa, one family, one one. One uh, child of the family contacted, contacted uh, another person, like playing with uh, some friends with uh, Ebola virus, right? And then what happens is we don't, they don't know whether this uh, little one, the child, was infected or not. So what happens is uh, the whole family, 27 or something like that, the whole family was quarantined in their house. They could not go out of their house. They should stay in the house for some time to make sure that uh, they have no Ebola virus. And the problem is usually they die of starvation. They have no food. No, if nobody helps them, the family, they will just die in their house. They cannot come out of the house, right? Because they are not so sure whether they got infected with Ebola or not. It's really serious problem, right? And this is the virus, actually. It, the virus killing people. And then um, the, I heard that you know if you get Ebola virus, then the internal organs are melting inside, and then it it, it doesn't function. 
What about Zika virus? Zika is transmitted by mosquitoes and especially Latin America. Can you see the world map? The, okay. The Latin America, it was uh, rampant. And then if the pregnant woman gets Zika virus, then the baby is born with a smaller head, right? Smaller head, and they cannot live a normal life, actually. Uh, it was really serious in Latin America. And not only that, for the homosexual people, Romans chapter 1 says the AIDS is the punishment for homosexual people from God because that's the terrible sin. It's interesting. Sodom and Gomorrah, it was destroyed because of the homosexual sins, right? The sodomy. And now it's getting worse and worse everywhere in the world, right? And in Romans chapter 1, verse 26, 27, let's read it together. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Men with men, women with men, women committing what is shameful. And they already received the penalty for their sin, right? So even the newspaper says AIDS or HIV virus, uh, it is the warning to sexual immorality. Okay? Uh, it's a warning from God. Let me show you one video clip about uh, this disease around the world because it's very serious these days. Let's see. Africa is far from contained. Because the outbreak is now officially out of control. In Liberia, contaminated bodies are being dumped in the street. This outbreak is the largest ever. Virus that is spreading. Chikungunya, 500,000 people are ill with the mosquito-borne virus in the Dominican Republic. Chikungunya got its name from the word in Mozambique that describes the intense joint pain caused by the virus. Once infected, the pain could last up to six months. There's no current cure for the virus. Now the Ebola virus has quickly turned into one of the worst epidemics in modern times and is spreading fast, claiming more and more lives by the day. The total cases in West Africa have reached an estimated 5,800 illnesses and over 2,800 deaths. The World Health Organization called today, quote, unparalleled in modern times. In the villages, the grave diggers can't keep up with the number of bodies. The number of cases in Liberia and Sierra Leone could reach 1.4 million by January. The virus is spreading much faster than efforts to contain it. You see, so many kinds of viruses and disease, uh, they're spreading. And then it's very dangerous. Maybe you heard about bird flu, right? There's no cure. That's why whenever it happens, they kill so many birds, like uh, you know, half million chickens they're bearing because there's no cure. And there's also swine flu. It was really serious in 2009. I don't know whether you know it or not, but 2009, the World Health Organization said up to 2 billion, 2 billion people could be infected by this swine flu. Of course, it didn't happen, right? But the swine flu, bird flu, the new diseases, without any cure, without any medicine, it can spread so quickly, and that's why WHO is always giving the warning. Okay, disease. Now, Jesus said there will be pestilences, which means disease, in various places. And that's what we see. Many years ago, the doctors said there will be no disease anymore because there will be vaccines for every disease, vaccines and medicine. But they don't say that anymore because there are so many diseases. And this earth also dying. Do you know that? Because in Hebrew chapter 1, um, the scripture says, this earth is growing old like a garment, like a clothes. It's growing old, worn out, right? So Hebrew chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, let's read it together. And you, Lord, in the beginning, lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish 
but you remain and they will all grow old like a garment. You Lord, in the beginning, you lay the foundation of the earth and heavens. These earth and heavens, they will perish, but God, you remain forever. So God will be there forever and ever, but heavens and the earth will perish, destroyed. They will all grow old like a garment. There's a problem with the weather these days, global warming, some part no rain, drought, some part you know, very cold weather, and the storms. Uh, this is Myanmar. These children bound themselves uh, against the tree because there's a storm, but they couldn't, they, they all died actually. You know? And uh, some part of the sea becomes red. Uh, this is uh, happening more and more often these days. Blood red beach causes panic. And do you know that in Revelation, the, the sea will become red. It will turn red. So for some reason, some part of the sea becomes red. And what about this uh, ozone layer? Ozone layer, today we learned that the water layer came down during the Noah's flood. And after that, God left a very thin layer called ozone layer. Because of this ozone layer, uh, some harmful radiation cannot come through. But now we have, a, these days we have a hole in the ozone layer. And look at this picture. You see? These are the skin cancer. Skin cancer. So skin cancer caused by ozone layer depletion. Because there's no ozone layer, you know, some harmful rays coming from the universe and then it's causing what? Skin cancer. Skin cancer. It's a serious problem. Uh, we are consuming, we are producing more and more CO2 and then the ozone layer becoming thinner and thinner and get depleted. And then some part, the skin cancer is uh, growing. And not only that, air pollution. Every day I check this air pollution these days, right? Before you go outside, you have to check whether the air quality is good or not these days, right? A few years ago, it was not like that. But these days, suddenly, right? And water pollution, of course. And the most problematic is land pollution. You know land pollution? This land pollution, it takes 100 years, a century to fix it, okay? people say because the, all kinds of these uh, things uh, remain there in the land, uh, it's very difficult to remove this land collection and uh, land pollution. And these days, it's becoming warmer and warmer, right? This is May, but I feel like it's summer these days, right? This global warming is getting serious. Last year, it was the warmest year, the hottest year in Korea, right? It was so warm. And in India, some road is melting. The asphalt is melting because uh, the temperature goes so high. Let me show you one video clip. The, the road becomes so sticky, you should be careful when you cross the road. If not, uh, you can fall down, actually. <laughs> Scorching heat melts road. After humans and animals, even roads have started giving up to the intense heat wave conditions prevailing in many parts of the country. It's very dangerous because the pedestrians in Gujarat's Valsad right? district. Why this is happening? Because it's getting warmer and warmer, right? and global warming. It means that this earth is growing old like a garment. Let me show you one more video clip. The title is The Earth is Dying. Even the secular uh, TV station is making this kind of documentary showing that uh, there's many dangerous things going on in this world and the earth is dying now because many signs are there. Let me show you. The 
Earth is dying. It's getting hotter. And storms are becoming so much powerful. Hurricanes. Cyclones. I spoke melting. Many kinds of natural disasters. Famines. Prices are going up. There are protests for the food. Age. And earthquakes, cyclones, storms. And disease. The earth is dying. Just like the Hebrew chapter 1 said, the earth is growing old like a garment, it's dying. I was thinking, 100 years ago, if people read the Bible, Hebrew chapter 1, read, oh, this word, this earth is growing old like a garment, they couldn't believe actually at the time, 100 years ago, because there's no pollution. In Korea, 100 years ago, no factories, no pollution, the rivers were clear, right? But now, we can believe all these things happening, right? The earth is growing old like a garment, and this is a warning from God. The end is near. The end is coming. The Bible doesn't say the human history will go on and on and on forever. There will be end. There was a beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And now, the end is coming. And uh, let me just explain a little bit about the human history from the beginning to the end, according to the Bible, according to the Bible, okay? So, between eternity, God started human history in the beginning. There's a beginning, and then God created Adam, the first man. From Adam un until Abraham, we call age of conscience because there was no Bible, no law, God let people live according to their conscience. And what happened was they fail. They fail. They became so wicked. One of the evidences is our Noah's flood. People became so wicked, God judged them with water. And from Abraham to Jesus, it's called the age of the elect or age of the law. Elect means the chosen people. God chose one people, gave them the law, the Bible. 
and let them keep the law, they fail again and again. They disobeyed God again and again, eventually killing Jesus Christ. So again, people fail. So from Jesus, the age of the Gentiles and age of grace started. What does that mean by age of Gentiles? Now, the Jewish people rejected Jesus, and now the chance was given to us, Gentiles. So we are believing in Jesus Christ, age of Gentiles. And age of grace means we, are not, we don't have to keep the law, but we can receive salvation by the grace of God, actually. So tomorrow, you will hear about this grace again. And the fact is, now we are living almost the end of this age of Gentiles or age of grace because when Jesus comes again in the air first, in the air, he will take all the born-again Christians up to heaven. This is called the rapture. Rapture means Jesus will take all the born-again Christians up to heaven. So Matthew chapter 24 are the signs which will happen before Jesus comes again. You saw the signs, hmm? the false Christ, the rumors of war, the disease, famines, and earthquakes. The, the Bible spread all over the world. We saw that yesterday. So all the signs which Jesus said would happen before he comes again, they are now happening. Which means Jesus can come anytime, even today, even if he comes today, we cannot say, oh, Jesus, how can you come today? You cannot say that because all the signs are already happening. And after Jesus comes, uh, after he took all the Christians up to heaven, the people remaining in this earth will enter this into the seven-year tribulation. What is this seven-year tribulation? This is the punishment for the judgment for the people who do not accept Jesus until the end. So that's why tribulation. And then later, Jesus will come on the earth, first in the air, second on the earth, and then there will be the last war, and then seven year tribulation will be over, and then millennial kingdom will start. The millennial kingdom is when um, God is restoring the earth like a garden of Eden, so that we can you know, enjoy. Um, we'll be there, those born again Christians will come to this millennial kingdom. So. Uh, right now, what I'd like to talk about is two things which will happen during this seven-year tribulation. Okay, let me tell you again. Now we are living almost the end of this age of Gentiles. And then, if we are truly born again, you don't have to worry about seven-year tribulation because you will be taken up to heaven and you will be in heaven while people who do not believe Jesus will suffer during this seven-year tribulation. But the reason why I'm talking about what will happen during this seven-year tribulation is because... It's very near, actually. It's very near. So first thing uh, happening during this seven-year tribulation is there will be one world leader. World leader will be there. One person will come out. He will control the whole world. And in the Bible, he's called the beast. So Revelation chapter 13, verse 4 and 5. Uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 4 and 5. Let's read it together. So they worshipped a dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. This dragon is Satan. Dragon is Satan. This beast is a human. Uh, this beast... A human world leader, he will be controlling the whole world, and people will uh, follow this beast, saying, Who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? Because this beast will have the uh, you know, great power. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Blasphemies means bad things about God, like a God is dead, or I'm God. He will say like that. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months, three and a half years. So this EU, European Union, this is a revived Roman Empire, actually. It started with a Roman treaty. Roman treaty. These European countries were together to start this European Union. 
they signed the treaty in Rome first because their dream is to reviving ancient Rome. So the world leader will come out of this EU, this Roman Empire revived, and this beast, this beast will place some idol, like an AI, artificial intelligence, or whatever idol which can speak in the temple. So Revelation chapter 13, verse 15, let's read it together. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause any, as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. It's interesting. This image is not human even. Image of the beast. Some image. But this image can speak. The image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So this image has some kind of intelligence. It can speak. I think I believe this is uh, artificial intelligence. You know, uh, These days, I saw in the newspaper, even there's one religion, they believe in artificial intelligence as God. Because AI is very smart, right? So, uh, before this uh, Antichrist appears in this world, the temple should be built. Uh, in the last session, I told you the temple was burned in AD 70 by Roman general Titus. No temple now, but this image will be set up in the temple, which means the temple will be built. Uh, the Jews, they want to have this temple again. That's why they pray in this wailing war again and again. They, they are praying to God, God give us the new temple. But now, uh, in the place where temple used to be, there's an Islamic mosque. That's why they cannot build a new temple. But they have a plan to build a new temple. So you see the title, Time for a New Temple. So they uh, already have a plan to build a new temple. They already prepared all the uh, building material and all these uh, instruments which will be used in the temple. The temple will be built soon. Not now, but it will be there. And everything is ready. The holy temple of Jerusalem will be built again. Okay. And this uh, beast, he will give the mark. And without mark, no one can buy or sell because this mark, uh, we call it 666 mark because uh, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, the number, the number is there for the mark is 666. So, uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 16, 17. Let's read it together. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. You see here? that no one may buy or sell, which means these days we use the money to buy or sell something, but during this seven-year tribulation, the money will be gone, but they will use some kind of mark on their hand on the, or on the forehead. Of course, uh, it wouldn't be this visible because it doesn't look good, but there's an even invisible uh, barcode, or uh, they might even now they put some small microchip uh, inside the animal so that they can keep track of the animal. So let me show you. This uh, chip becomes smaller and smaller. Uh, do you see this one? This one? This is a microchip called RFID chip. This is a grain of rice, grain of rice. This chip has become this small, so small actually, right? So what will happen is the beast, the Antichrist, will give this mark to everyone. And Revelation chapter 14 says, this mark is the mark of the beast, mark of the Satan. Whoever received the mark will go to hell. Because this mark is the mark of Satan. But if you don't get the mark, Antichrist will kill you. Antichrist will say, if you don't get mark, you'll get punished. And you cannot buy or sell. Or your children cannot go to school. 
Nothing. You can do nothing, actually, right? So what can you do? Don't worry, right? If you are truly born again, you will be there in heaven, not here. This is about those people who are not born again, actually. Okay? For those people who are not born again, if you are not saved this time, you will have no chance during this seven-year tribulation. No chance. That's why you have to be born again as soon as possible. And finally, at the end of this seven-year tribulation, there will be the last word. I don't have much time to explain in detail, but Ezekiel chapter 38. Do you remember Ezekiel? Ezekiel chapter 36 was about the restoration of the land. Ezekiel chapter 37 we read, it was about the dry bone and restoration of the land, uh, the nation. And Ezekiel chapter 38 is about the last war. And in this last war, Russia will invade Israel with uh, Iran, Ethiopia, and Libya, and some other countries, actually. Russia used to be a Christian country. Do you know that? Before it became a communist, it used to be the Christian country, Russia. Russia was not significant in human history. They, they were never strong before, but after they became the communist country, now they became very powerful. And the scripture says, the Bible says, Russia will take Iran, Ethiopia, Libya. Both three countries were very close to America before, but they turned against America. They became pro-Soviet Union. And then uh, this is what will happen. Revelation chapter 16, verse 16. Let's read it together. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Amageddon, Mugito. Amageddon is a Greek name. Mugito is a Hebrew name. So this is the name of the place. This is Mugito or Amageddon. So this is the place for the last word. So if you go there, there's a signboard saying that... Um, it's not so clear, uh, Mugido or Armageddon, in which the final battle will be fought at the end of the days. Revelation says this is the place for the last war, and last war will be nuclear war. And those who know the Bible, they say, when will Russia invade Israel? Because that is the beginning of the last war. Look at this. Zechariah, the prophet, more than 2,400 years ago, he saw the last war. He saw the last war. And from this description, we know that last war is a nuclear war, for sure. So, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 12. Uh, let's read it together. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongue shall dissolve in their mouth. Okay, look at this. When Russia and some other countries, when they invade Israel, this shall be the plague, punishment, with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. These countries coming to attack Israel, God will punish them. How? Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. What does that mean? They don't even have time to fall down. While they are standing on their feet, the flesh will dissolve, the eyes shall dissolve, the tongue shall dissolve. And this is not the conventional word or, you know, the time they were using the sword, if you kill somebody with the sword, they fall down first and then the flesh will dissolve. But not like that with a nuclear war. So look at this. This person, this man, starts screaming. Ah, and then before he finishes screaming, all his flesh dissolved, and the eyes dissolved, and the tongue dissolved. And this is what happens in the nuclear war, right? So what Zechariah saw, the flesh being dissolved, uh, dissolving while they are standing on their feet, is this one, nuclear war. So the last war will be the nuclear war. And look at this. Because during this nuclear war, one third, one, uh, one third of mankind will be killed. 
So Revelation chapter 9, verse 15, 16. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill how many? A third of mankind. In one day, one hour, during one hour, one third of mankind will be killed. These days, you know, the population of the world population is 7.6 billion or 7.7 .7 billion is increasing, but one third of mankind is more than 2.5 billion. 2.5 billion people will be killed in one hour. So only, you know, nuclear war. So let's see. I told you yesterday, the Bible, there are many earthly things and heavenly things. And so far, until today, I was talking about these earthly things because Jesus said, John chapter 3, verse 12, let's read it together. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So think about these earthly things you learned this time. The history of Israel, all this human history in the past, about the universe, about the Bible, about the creation. So far, I was talking about these earthly things. And because of these earthly things, we believe the Bible is the word of God. No human can write such book, right? And then, now it's time to talk about heavenly things. When we see these earthly things are true, then we can believe in these heavenly things. So, the last topic today is uh, the rapture, the second coming of Jesus and rapture. Okay. What is rapture? Look at this picture. In Acts chapter 1, when Jesus was ascending to heaven, he was going up and up and up, and people were watching. And then finally he was covered with a cloud and gone. And then these angels were there, talking to these uh, disciples. What are you looking at, Galileans, the disciples? Jesus will come exactly the same way as he went up to heaven. So we know that when Jesus comes, he will come from heaven first. And when he comes in the air, when he comes second time in the air, what will happen is all the born-again Christians will be taken up. This is called the rapture. So Jesus will come on the cloud in the air, and all the Christians will be taken up. This is called rapture. And when this rapture will happen, we have no idea, because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, 37, but of that day and hour, no one knows. No one knows. No one knows when Jesus will come. This is, uh, I think it makes sense. If you know when Jesus will come, like he, we know Jesus will come one year later, can you live a normal life? Would you study? Uh, if, you're study if you're a student, if you know Jesus will come for certain one year later, will you st study? Why bother, right? <laughs> and uh, so what I'm saying is, uh, if we know the exact time of Jesus' second coming, we cannot live a normal life, actually. That's why it's a secret. No one knows. It's a blessing. But the time will come, and when the time comes, this is what will happen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, 52. Let's read it together. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Changed, changed. This body, our body will be changed into spiritual body or glorious body. This is a mystery, secret. But now we know what will happen. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. What will happen? For the trumpet will sound. The trumpet. Ba -ba -bum, ba -ba -bum. Right? Trumpet. Why? In the Old Testament time, when the trumpet is blowing, they were they gathered together, actually. So when uh, they should be gathered together, they blew the trumpet. Right? So it's time to gather together. 
For the trumpet will sound and the dead, the dead in Christ, the dead Christians, those Christians who were dead, they will be raised in corruptible resurrection. And we who are alive shall be changed. So it's like this. We will be transformed. Now the body we have is like the seed, but when Jesus comes again, we will be changed into something like this flower, totally different. And now this body we have is like an egg, but when Jesus comes again, we'll become like a bird, much better. And uh, this is a, a another level, actually, totally new body. Um, this is good news because, you know, um, in this new body or glorious body or spiritual body, we don't get sick, we don't die, right? Do you remember after Jesus' resurrection, he came through the world when the disciples block, uh, locked the door. Jesus just came through the world, right? So that body of Jesus uh, will be given to us on the day Jesus comes again. But for those who are not born again, that day will be the worst day in their life because, look at this, Jesus said, two women will be working in the field Suddenly, one will be taken up and the other will be uh, left behind. And this woman is crying. Why? Not because he, her friend is uh, uh, disappearing, but he, she knew, she knows that she has no more chance. With Jesus coming, second coming, the age of Gentiles will be finished and she will have no more chance. Two women grinding meal, because the Jewish people, Jewish women grinding meal every morning to prepare for breakfast. Suddenly, look at this, suddenly one disappears and the other will be left behind. And two people sleeping together in the night because the earth is round. Some part is the nighttime, some part is daytime, some part is morning time. That's why this is happening. Morning time, they are grinding meal, one disappear. And daytime, they're working in the field, one is gone. And uh, the other place, the other part of the uh, earth, they are sleeping, but suddenly one is taken and the other is left behind. That's what Jesus said. Luke chapter 17, verse 34, 35. Let's read it together. I tell you, in that night, there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken and the other left. This is rapture. And this is not a joke. This is true. This is real. And this is what will happen when Jesus comes again. Right? The question is, are you ready? Are you ready? Like when Jesus comes in the air? Are you sure that you will be taken up? Or you are not so sure? I met some Christians. They are so afraid of Jesus' second coming. Because they say, oh, Pastor, I don't know whether I, can, I will be taken up. I don't know whether I will be raptured or not. I'm not so sure. And those who are not so sure, they are not born again. They have to make sure about their salvation first because you know, if you are truly born again, you have no fear. You know Jesus keeps his promise and he will take you. But because your sins were never forgiven, you have no assurance of salvation and you are not so sure whether you will be taken up or not. So even in the church, this is church, right? Not every church people will be taken up because they are not born again. You know what happens? They come to church and they listen to the sermon, but they have their own secret. What's the secret? They are not truly born again. And their heart is still with the world. And they are afraid of Jesus' second coming, but they don't show it to others. They just pretend they are born again Christians, but the day, the day will reveal whether you are truly born again or not. Right now, I cannot see your heart. I don't know who are truly born again, who are not. I have no idea. Because we can pretend, you know, right? But you cannot, you can deceive me, but you cannot deceive God. The day will 
show whether you are truly born again Christian or not. Look at this. This is from the movie Left Behind. Uh, do you remember that when Jesus uh, uh, resurrected, he left the, the cloth which bound him, left in his tomb. So when people are raptured, their clothes will remain. So I think uh, uh, this movie, um, you see, uh, when people are disappearing, their clothes will remain, but the body will be gone. Let's see. In the airplane, people disappear, but their clothes are there. No pilots. They are. Uh, they were so raptured. They are panic. She's calling her mom, but no answer. Mom? Mom, please pick up the phone. I don't know what's going on. Her mother also disappeared, leaving her journey. <laughs> Some people say, how can people disappear? I don't know. I just believe because it's in the Bible. Can you find any error or mistake in the Bible? No. Whatever Jesus said about his second coming, all the signs are happening now, which is really remarkable because Jesus said, talked about these signs 2,000 years ago almost. They are happening now. Predicting the future is impossible for us. We don't even know what will happen tomorrow or even what will happen in five minutes. But Jesus, whatever Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 21, all these signs which will happen before he comes again, they are happening right now, without any single exception. They are all happening, which means that his second coming is very near. So, in one church, I'll show you one video clip. One pastor was preaching about the second coming of Jesus, and suddenly rapture happens. Some people remain again in the church because they were naturally born again. Let me show you. Jesus Christ is coming back. He's talking church. about the Bible second coming of Jesus. Matthew, chapter 24, verse 42. Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. I want you to know, church, that Jesus Christ could come this month. This month. Or he might come next week. Next week. Or he could even come. <laughs> The
the reason why we are having this Bible seminar is to make sure about your salvation, actually, right? This is a good chance, actually. Uh, we are having this seminar, studying the Bible. Why? Because salvation is so important. How can he escape if he neglects such a great salvation? We started with that scripture today, right? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. So great a salvation, such a great salvation, such an important salvation. We have to make sure about our salvation. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3 says, A prudent man, a wise man, sees danger and takes refuge. Avoid it, right? But the simple, the simple means the foolish person keeps going and suffer for it. When you see the danger, you have to avoid it. The wise people do that. If you keep going, keep going, and you will suffer. But this matter of salvation is so important, you have to make sure, really, this time. Okay? So from yesterday to today, till today, uh, we had the three sessions talking about these earthly things, the evidences that the Bible is true. I believe this Bible is not human work. No human can write such a book, but it is the word of God. There's no such book in the world. No prophecies in other religious books. Only the Bible has the prophecies and all these things we studied that shows that the Bible is the word of God. So tomorrow, we have two sessions starting from 10 o'clock. Okay, not 11. Usually we start around 11, but 10 o'clock we'll start here. So please come early, 10 o'clock and, uh, and 2, 2 p.m. Uh, we'll have two sessions. And this is about your, about your individual destiny, individual salvation. And that's the conclusion of this Bible seminar. So if you do not attend, if you do not make it, now, uh, all you hear so far is useless, actually. Okay? So, tomorrow, these two sessions are the most important sessions of this Bible seminar. So, please come. Because that will make a difference in your life. Actually, you know, it's about your eternal life. And it's about uh, your eternal salvation. So, please come and listen. Because faith comes by hearing. You don't have to do anything. You just sit and listen carefully. And God will change your heart, and God will give you this uh, spiritual salvation. So tomorrow, what time we start? 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. Okay, please come, and um, I want everyone to come and uh, you know, make sure about their salvation through this Bible seminar. Let's pray together. Our gracious Father. You taught us many things from the Bible, especially what will happen in the future. There was the beginning, and there will be ending of this human history, and it's very near when we see all the signs which will happen before Jesus' second coming. So Lord, I pray for everyone in this room that no one will be lost, and no one will go to eternal hell because they do not listen and they do not believe. So Lord, please give us a chance to come tomorrow and we'll be listening. And uh, we'll talk about the gospel message, the good news, and we'll talk about our salvation. So Lord, thank you so much for this time of all these evidences and all the signs and all the prophecies. So um, we are going back home now, so please take us home safely and help us to come here tomorrow so that we can meet together and we can continue to study your word. Thank you so much for this time, and in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.